um, so, so when I was reading this, and I told you guys last week, whenever I speak, it never fails that the thing that I'm speaking about, I feel like is more for me than for anybody else. And um, so, so Saul struggles with this pride, this arrogance thing, all this kind of stuff. He, he lets his pride and his arrogance get in the way of hearing Samuel speak to him. Samuel loved him. He cared for him. God sent him there to speak to him, and, and Saul just, he, he couldn't hear any of it. But I'm going to keep going try to get through this. In verse 24, Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned. I violated the Lord's command and your instructions. I was afraid of those people, and so I gave in to them. Now I beg you, forgive my sin and come back with me so that I may worship the Lord. But Samuel said to him, I will not go back with you. You have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you as king over Israel. As Samuel turned to leave, Saul caught hold of the hem of his robe, and it tore. Then Samuel said to him, The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to one of your neighbors, to one better than you. He who is the glory of Israel does not lie or change his mind, for he is not a man that he should change his mind. <clears throat> Saul has moved from shifting the blame from his soldiers to now his own people. The very people in the kingdom wanted him to do this, wanted him to keep the cattle so they can make a sacrifice to the Lord their God. It's a, re a, rep a repetitious, repetitious, whatever that word is, a repeated thing that, that Saul's just continuing to do. He's not accepting responsibility for what's happened and is, you know, with where the responsibility counts, the buck stops with him. He just keeps passing the blame on. And finally, Saul, or Samuel tells him, he says, look, the Lord has rejected you as king. Your kingdom is going to be passed on to someone else. Saul still doesn't get it. In verse 30, he says, I've sinned, but that kills me. <laughs> I've sinned, but. Any of you guys in here ever said that? I'm sorry, but. Not I'm a sorry, but. Don't have that. <laughs> I'm sorry, comma, but. Anybody? Okay. I said it. I said it. Thank you, thank you, thank you. These guys, when, well, when you guys get older, y'all going to rock the universe. These guys over here, they'll catch up with you. Anyway, I'm sorry. I've sinned, but please honor me before the elders of my people and before Israel. Come back with me so that I may worship the Lord your God. So Samuel went back with Saul, and Saul worshiped the Lord. I don't know why Samuel went back with Saul. That is beyond me. Samuel said, bring Agag, king of the Amalekites, to me. And basically, Samuel just takes Agag, Agag's life. <laughs> Saul, I mean, he just, he befuddles me. But, you know, it's really not that hard to comprehend because, like I said, like these three guys up here were so honest to admit, I've said the same thing. I've sinned, but. I'm sorry, but, you know, she deserved it. I'm sorry, but, you know, it's just my mom. I'm sorry, but, and you can fill in the blank. We've all done it. We've all done what Saul did. When people come to us and want to talk with us and say, you know, like, I, I don't know if I shared this. Maybe I did. I don't remember. I know I shared it in my small group. But I shared how my youth pastor came and confronted me with my drug problem. And I said, you know, I don't have a drug problem. I don't know what you're talking about. I, he could ask me that a hundred times, and I would have denied it. Or I would have said, well, you know, my buddies, you know, they got drug problems. But me, you know, I just hang out with them. You know, I'll hold the joint for them and, you know, pass it, you know, so they don't have to get caught and all this kind of stuff. But I didn't have a problem. I was just like Saul in my pride and my arrogance and my refusal to accept responsibility for my own actions. I would say something like that. I was capable of it. I'm sorry, but. Absolutely ridiculous. So I want to just transition and um, go look at uh, David. If you'll turn to 2 Samuel uh, chapter 12, verse 17. I'm going to cover this in three minutes, so y'all hang on. <laughs> All right, it says, uh, <clears throat> and start in verse 7. Or actually, let's go down here. Yeah, no, start at 7. 2 Samuel 12, verse 7, it says, Nathan said to David, you are that man. Remember, Nathan came and told him the parable about the sheep and the guy, the rich man that took the one little sheep from the guy that only had one sheep. Remember that? Okay. Well, anyway, he said, you're that man that took that sheep, and this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you the house of Israel and Judah, but if all of this had been too little, I would have given you even more. Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with a sword and took his wife to be your own. 
You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword will never depart from your own house because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite. And go on down to uh, verse 13. Listen to David's response. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord, period. That was David's response. David wasn't looking for someone to blame, you know, his mistakes on. I mean, he slept with Bathsheba. He had her husband killed. He did those things. So when, Sam, or when Nathan comes to him and says, you know, look, what you've done is wrong in the eyes of the Lord, David says, I have sinned. That's it. That was his response. Now compare that to Saul. Saul spent, you know, so much time blaming this person and that person. And even when he did have the, you know, gusto or whatever to say, well, you know, I sinned, he put a but and then listed, you know, all this stuff. But, well, you know, would you please honor me, you know, so the people will think I'm really cool and stuff like that. And really didn't do anything wrong. It was just a mistake that this bad stuff is happening. Totally not what David did. I have a reason why I believe that David did that and why Saul did not. Even though David had done a really nasty thing, actually he'd done several nasty things, and he'll do several nasty things later on in his life, I believe that David did things the way he did because his heart was after God. That's what the Bible says, and I believe that. He had a heart after God. And I don't know how many of you guys are familiar with David's life. We know David and Samson, or um, David and Goliath. We know David and Bathsheba, and we know David and Solomon. Solomon built the temple, he wrote Proverbs, all those types of things. But I'll tell you this much. David had a hard life. David, you know, what I read about the sword never departing from his house, well, those of you guys that don't know a lot about David, there was a lot, a lot of junk that happened under David's roof. Nasty, despicable murderous, adult, I mean, just nasty stuff. David had it very, very difficult. But in the midst of all of that, it says that David was a man after God's own heart. Did you know that next to Jesus, there's more written about David or from the mouth of David than any other person in the Bible? More than Moses, more than Abraham, more than Isaac, more than Jacob, the fathers of the Israelites, more than any other person next to Jesus is written about David. And I think that's because every single person in here, including myself and Eric and everyone else, we could all associate with David. Anybody in here ever had a lustful thought? You don't have to raise your hand. If you do. Thank you, Nick. He's in my small group. We'll talk about that. Hey, right here, Nick can talk to me about that. Okay, none of you girls. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. Anybody in here ever felt rejected? Okay. We can sympathize with David. I could go on and on and on. We can sympathize with David. David was a model for us of how to have a heart for God. But more than, I don't want to say more than that. Excuse me for saying that. In that, David was a model for us for when someone comes to you and says, look, I'm concerned about what's going on in your life. Like my youth pastor did. I'm concerned about what's going on in your life. Like is very personal to me. Like a friend of mine did about a week ago, and said, Andy, I'm concerned about some things that are going on in your life and your relationship with your wife. I can honestly say I responded like David did by the grace of God. I've been approached about things in my life before. I did not respond that way. But maybe I studied all this for the last two weeks, three weeks to prepare for that. In my own personal life, I had to make a decision. When someone came to me and said, I'm concerned about this in your life, I had to choose, was I going to respond like Saul did and say, you know, well, it's my wife's fault. Who talked to her? Or was I going to say, you know what, that's my fault, and I need to deal with that. I have sinned, and I need to deal with that. Praise the Lord, and only by His grace did I do that. So I ask you this. When someone comes and talks to you about things that are going on in your life because they care about you, they love you, they want to see the best things that God has in store for your life become manifest in your life, how are you going to respond? And in the past, how have you responded? And what can you do different in the future?